So the sermon this morning is about curiosity and the opposite of curiosity, which I take to be something like judgmentalness, closed-mindedness, and anxiety. And uh, it begins with a story, and um, I realized when I, when I told this story at the first service, I, I mistold it, and it's supposed to end with some lightness, and instead I got like, People staring at me like they were concerned. <laughs> and and that, the story is meant to evoke curiosity. We'll see. It's one of the fables. It's one of the fables of Rabbi Ed Friedman. It goes something like this Once upon a time, there was a six year old who loved to draw with crayons. The boy's parents were pleased by his love of drawing. However, one thing stood out in his drawings. Whenever he drew a person, usually a stick figure, the person was never vertical, standing. Body was always drawn horizontally. The parents noticed this and found it odd. The boy's crayon drawings evolved. The boy continued to draw bodies lying horizontally, but now he added a red crayon and added little red streaks coming out of the stick figures. This made the parents more concerned, and they decided to go to, the, uh, to their son's teacher, show the drawings to the teacher, and she agreed that they were concerning. Then the parents made a discovery. Their child had taken to drawing on the walls of his room, only now the drawings also included not just horizontal bodies and red, but also detached arms and legs. The worry of the parents increased further. They made an emergency appointment with a clinician who specialized in working with children. They went into the appointment, and uh, the clinician said to the six-year-old, can you draw one of your pictures? And so the six-year-old sat down and began to draw just what was drawn on his bedroom walls. And the clinician looked and said, I see. How do, how do, these, paint, how do these drawings make you feel? Do they make you feel sad? He said, no, not sad. Scared? No, not scared. Angry? No, not angry. And the boy continued, the only thing that would make me angry is if somebody told me that I couldn't become what I want to become when I grow up, which is a doctor who helps people who are hurting. <laughs> See, that's the reaction I wanted. <laughs> still be concerned. <laughs> I have a friend named Jake. Uh, Jake is a Unitarian Universalist minister, and Jake has this mantra that I've observed him use on a number of occasions. It's a piece of advice that he gives, and it always seems so wise when he utters it. It's a simple mantra. Two words. Stay curious. Stay curious. A little while ago, I wrote to Jake to ask him about the origins of his mantra, and he replied that he didn't think that it came to him from any one source, but that during his ministry, one of the things he's done is undertaken a deep study of family system and emotional system theories, like those done by Bowen and Friedman. And one of the ideas at the core of that work is finding a healthy way to engage with anxiety. And Jake suggests that adopting a posture of curiosity in the face of anxiety helps to keep you balanced and centered. Jake continued that one time he received an email from a coach and mentor of his, and she signed the email, Stay Fascinated. Stay Fascinated. And that line just stuck with him, and he adopted it. Stay fascinated. Stay curious. 
I want to let you in on a little secret about, about some ministers' sermons. Sometimes sermons are preached out of a depth of experience, knowledge, and excellence. <laughs> practice that is deep and regular and beautiful, and this, this meditation practice has resulted in tremendous ministerial, tremendous personal growth. That may, uh, you know, inspire the minister to preach on meditation, but other times the minister might preach on something they're struggling with. For example, that preacher may be absolutely failing and flailing with their meditation practice. It may be dismal to them. They might be finding all sorts of reasons not to do it, and when they manage to try to meditate, the time's experienced with resentment and distraction, and that might be a great opportunity to preach about meditation. Not to lie, not to deceive, not to pretend like they have all the answers figured out, not to practice hypocrisy, but to engage with honesty. As far as practicing curiosity, please do not think that I am someone who has it all figured out all the time. I don't think that I'm a wretched, miserable failure either, but I do notice that there are parts of my life that I manage to approach with just deep curiosity, and then there's other moments that I, I kind of don't manage to be curious. And I've noticed that my life tends to go better when I can manage to maintain a perspective of curiosity. Work goes better when we're able to be curious and fascinated about our work. Relationships with friends or with families or with your beloved, relationships go better when we're genuinely curious about the other person and genuinely curious about the relationship. Our hobbies and our volunteer work go better to the extent that we can stay fascinated by these areas of our lives. And yes, religion and spirituality and religious community go better when we approach these with some element of curiosity. What does it look like? What does it look like to stay curious? Curiosity is marked by attention, interest, receptiveness, and playfulness. It's something, I think, like what Victoria Safford wrote about in her meditation on open eyes. Think of yourself as a prism made of glass reflecting everything exactly as it is, unable to exist dishonestly, reflecting beauty where there's beauty, violence where there's violence, loveliness and unexpected joy where there is joy. The opposite of curiosity is judgmentalness or a failure to interact that distorts the reality of the perceived world and by, by distorting it limits the self. It's not that everything that you're curious about will turn out to be beautiful or wonderful. Part of being curious is encountering realities and ideas and truths that are disturbing and troubling. And so I want to ask you, when during this past week did you feel the most curious? Was there a point when you encountered the world with curiosity? And how did that feel? And the opposite, was there a point during the last week where you did not feel the least bit curious? Did you close yourself off from something you could have encountered with a more open mind? <clears throat> I want to bring in religion and talk about the <coughs> intersection of curiosity and religion. While I was preparing this sermon, I happened to be reading a book for fun. Uh, the book has absolutely nothing to do with anything I'm talking about this morning. But as I was reading it, 
there suddenly appeared in the text a line that came from out of nowhere, apropos of nothing, that said, remember the famous Buddhist teaching to stay curious. <laughs> a sign, I thought. <laughs> and then, more interestingly, after a bit of research, it seems dubious to me that there is a famous Buddhist teaching to stay curious. <laughs> Interesting. But there is, there is a Buddhist teaching about suffering, which has to do with not avoiding suffering by fleeing from it, but rather engaging it in a way that is open-hearted and open-minded. When we're curious, we occupy a space that is neither attachment nor avoidance. And Buddhist teachings seem to advise us to try to find that middle space, that curious space, somewhere between attachment and avoidance. I want to talk a little bit about curiosity and Unitarian Universalism. When I was a t-shirt, I saw an advertisement in the back of a Unitarian Universalist publication that was advertising t-shirts with UU slogans on them. And there was one when I saw it, I knew I had to get it. The t-shirt was emblazoned with a big, bright red burning question mark, a flaming question mark. And the text on the t-shirt said, the answer is to question. Unitarian Universalism. <laughs> I was the type of teenager that wanted a shirt like that. And so I ordered it. And it seems to me that a lot of the times when our faith has done well, it's done well by embracing religious questioning, by embracing curiosity. I'm so grateful for how that perspective helped to form me. It is included in our tradition's history the appropriate questioning of religious authority and then claiming the freedom to practice and search and think outside of limits that authority has imposed. This questioning has included questioning religious teachings asking whether they serve the cause of human flourishing or if they reinforce unjust and problematic power arrangements. This holy curiosity has included an openness to new wisdom, new revelation, scientific discovery, and all of the learnings that we have made. And this holy curiosity has included asking open-hearted questions about diverse religious traditions, asking what is beautiful and good and true about those texts and traditions and beliefs. Peruse through our hymnal and you will see readings selected from a variety of sources, a curiosity and an openness. We even had a reading this morning, our chalice fighting from the Upanishads. And our faith tradition has asked bold questions about the nature of humanity, ethics, morality, inclusion, and everything else under the sun, it seems. While I'm talking about curiosity, though, I might also mention that there is a different type of questioning. The answer is the question, but there is some questioning that's done not in good faith. Some questions asked in bad faith are not designed to bring understanding, but to tear it down. There can be no good way, it seems to me, to respond to arguments offered in bad faith because the objective of someone arguing in bad faith is not to arrive at truth, but to abolish truth. I remember that lesson from kindergarten about there being no dumb questions, and there very well may not be. But there are disingenuous questions. 
There are pointed statements with a question mark at the end that pretend to be questions but are really not. I you know, remember going to, going to a lecture once and the, at the end said, we're gonna have a time of question and answer and you're invited to ask questions but not to give statements with question marks at the end. <laughs> so how do we know? How do we know that the questions that we ask are coming from a place of holy curiosity? I think we know that is the case when we ask them with an awareness that we are truly open-minded to the answer, truly interested in what the answer may be, willing, in fact, to be transformed by it. Genuine curiosity involves openness, neither attachment nor avoided, but that middle playful space between. Stay curious, stay fascinated, Amen. And our uh, closing hymn this morning is going to be um, one of our favorites. It's number 1064, Blue Boat Home. I, advise, uh, I uh, invite you, I advise you, I invite you to rise in body or in spirit as we sing our closing poems. Thank you.